from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. Well, it's my great pleasure, in addition to Georgette and others that keep this place running so well, to welcome you to this. This is really a very special anniversary. In the, history, I think, of certainly of the Library of Congress and of uh, our intercontinental relations, really. <clears throat> this, is, this is the first special reading room created uh, within the Library of Congress for uh, something other than a, either a generic special type of collection um, or else these were essentially all uh, American in the sense of United States uh, centered materials and so forth. So this was the first broadening out. Um, the 75th anniversary of this reading room. This is the only reading room that has murals in it that came very rapidly after its founding of the reading room in, in 1939. Um, it has all kinds of unique features. <clears throat> and one feature that I always notice whenever I come up here is that there are a lot of people using it. And that's wonderful. That's what we're here for, of course. And we've since expanded now, have reading rooms for other parts of the world. Uh, but this was the founding one. And um, we're in the process of sort of mapping out the future of the Library of Congress. And uh, it was my selection, even though I'm no expert on this part of the world, um, to include only one area to mark out for specially increased uh, attention and um, uh, commitment on the part of the Library of Congress, and that is this original uh, collection, because uh, the study of Latin America is often talked about. Um, there are wonderful people in it, some of whom will be speaking here uh, with us today. But the fact of the matter is that we've um, We've not really paid enough attention to our neighbors in the hemisphere. I know that people often say this. Uh, I remember when I came down to run the, uh, from my own life as a professor, came down to run the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, we set up, first of all, because the Cold War was still on, a, 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 what's now what we call the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies, so that there was a special emphasis on uh, somewhere in Washington on something in which the Library of Congress had the greatest collection outside of that country. Well, the collections of, of Hispanic America, Lusatian America, and the Iberian Peninsula are quite unique in many respects, uh, not just in America, but in the world. And it's a great resource for better understanding here in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, I think the 75th anniversary uh, is the anniversary of something which really, in a way, launched the library into not just the accumulation of materials on a global basis, but the actual collect development of collections that were unique, have unique reading rooms. I must say, this is a particularly congenial one. You still have access to books, and the, the computers are here mixed. The Library of Congress has been, in recent years, and will become increasingly a both-and institution, not an either-or. The idea that uh, our bibliographers uh, have shown recently um, to me, and in very detailed analytic ways, <clears throat> how there are many things that can only be accessed here in these three buildings on Capitol Hill, that they can't be digitized for various reasons. Um, and uh, that to have a com comprehensive knowledge of any major region, you really have to have both old traditional book-based 
uh, materials, uh, as well as all the new tsunami, multiple tsunamis of material that we're now getting in the digital world. So it's a combination of the two, and that's kind of the American way. You don't, um, you add new Americans without subtracting the old. Uh, you have a kind of, I speak as one of the more senior uh, figures, at least in terms of chronological development, as we might uh, euphemistically put it. But it's wonderful to see so many young people interested in this. And this, as I say, is going to be an emphasis, I think, over the next couple of years. And it's built all solely on the strength, not just of the wonderful staff we have here and uh, uh, the dedication, tremendous dedication, to making this accessible, interesting, congenial, um, that scholarship uh, can really be fun, enjoyable, and it can have uh, a sort of active heartbeat right here in a room like this. So I want to congratulate you all, and I want to congratulate those, those of you who are speaking today and others, readers who use it. We, um, you know, as in, uh, somebody once said to me, one staff member, I've quoted it, even though it's a bit inelegant, uh, the cow loves to be milked. Uh, I mean, we really, uh, it's no good having all this material if it doesn't have a wonderful staff to help you, work with you on whatever you're doing, and at the same time, a kind of dedication as we have here to long service of past directors, the founding directors, the whole Huntington vision that this should be endowed as a, as a center uh, uh, of real intersection between the world of thought, of culture, uh, and even of policy. But it's not so much policy research as deep research, deeper understanding which, uh, which we're more and more conscious of because of the growing Hispanic population within our midst. And we hope to make a, a stronger emphasis on involving more, more people uh, and more, more Spanish-speaking people. Our World Digital Library, for instance, which is uh, now a UNESCO project um, uh, and which, which basically we're running and organized, uh, the commentary there is in seven languages, and Spanish language is far and away the most heavily used uh, in this uh, remarkable uh, enterprise, which uh, the quality, both technically and substantively, of what we're putting online, and with the cooperation of, I don't know, the last time I checked, it was uh, 85 uh, foreign institutions who are digitizing their material, and getting us uh, to us, no, it's 85 countries, I'm sorry, and it's something like 160 uh, institutions all around the world that are contributing things. And the intense language in Spanish and also in Portuguese, uh, which between them really dominate the 10 top country users. So it's, that's ahead of uh, China, uh, Chinese, which is one, another of the languages they had, ahead of Russian, French, um, and even English. So it's, uh, it's another sign that our need to broaden the understanding, even as we deepen the scholarship in this area, is a main priority. And it's one of those things that you just don't invent if you come along. I come along as the 13th Librarian of Congress, and I've been here for quite a while. But I'm more, more, the longer I'm here, the longer I'm conscious of how we're building on what past generations have done, both of scholars who use it and of staff who keep it living, uh, living, constantly growing, and constantly expanding access for better knowledge, mutual knowledge, in an increasingly interdependent world in which so much of the future depends on the creative use of knowledge as well as the fresh generation of it across hitherto often uh, 
impenetrable barriers and inaccessible materials. So thank you all for being here. I'm sorry I can't stay, but I'm glad this is being recorded so I'll have a chance to digest it in the future. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, the speakers. Uh, thank you, those of you who use this wonderful reading room, which is really a continuing inspiration to all of us here in the Library of Congress, and most especially Georgette, Barbara, Yeda, all the rest of you who make this place a living and constantly growing and, and ever deepening resource for better understanding of those with whom we, we share this Western Hemisphere. So many thanks and best wishes for another 75 years. And I In addition to thanking Dr. Billington, I also want to thank Robert Darzer, the Deputy Librarian of Congress, Mark Sweeney, the Head of Library Services, Helena Zinkham, the Director of Collections and Services, and all the others who have helped us, such as Lisa Stubbs, Jean Berry, and countless, countless people who helped to make this as a wonderful success, and especially Catalina Gomez, the Hispanic Division Program Assistant. Then I would like to recognize Laura Ramirez Lasgado from the Mexican Cultural Institute, who was very generous, the Institute was very generous in supporting our Mexican portal. Then I would like to thank Cole Blazer, who I hope is here, who was the immediate uh, past president I and mean, director of the Hispanic Division, a very important influence and a very transformative chief of the Hispanic Division. I would also like to recognize Everett Larson, I hope he's here, the uh, head of the reading room who just retired 40 years, service on October 3rd, and John Aber, our wonderful alumnus who became the chief of the MAP Division and retired last year. And then I would like to introduce our guest speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Deborah Jacobs. She's the Rita Di Giglionardi Holloway University Librarian and Vice Provost of Library Affairs of the at Duke University Library, Duke University Library. Prior to her appointment in 2005, she served as Director of Collection Services, the founding head of the International and Area Studies Department, and Librarian for Latin America and Iberia at Duke. As Visiting Program Officer at the Associ Association of Research Libraries, ARL, she launched the Global Resources Program a joint initiative of ARL and the Association of American Universities, AAU, and directed it from 1996 until 2002. Uh, Dr. Jacobs holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, a library degree from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's and PhD in Latin American history from Stanford University. She is an adjunct associate professor of history at Duke. She has been a consultant to library systems in Chile and Turkey, as well as in the United States. She has served as director of, and associate director of the Consortium of Latin American Studies at Duke and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has been a member since 1996 of the steering committee for the program of Latin American Libraries and Archives funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and administrated by Harvard's Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Jacobs is president of the Association of Research Libraries and a member of the board of Quali Ole Open Library Environment. She is the member of SPARC Steering Committee and has served as president of the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries. Jacobs has published on library management, global libraries, international education, and Latin American studies. Her scholarship has focused on the social history of Latin America, immigration to Argentina, and the history of tango and memory and identity. With us, Deborah Jacobs. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as a librarian and a Latin American historian, it gives me great pleasure to be part of this celebration of 75 years of the Hispanic Division and 79 years of the Handbook of Latin American Studies. Both have figured prominently in the research of countless scholars and students since their creation in respectively 1939 and 1936, and continue to do so even as digital media have expanded the scope and scale of the scholarly endeavor and the reach of the Hispanic division. Lasting cultural legacies can always be traced to visionary men and women. In the case of the Hispanic Division, we must thank the late Archer Huntington for endowing a fund at the Library of Congress in 1927 to be used to support the acquisition 
of materials in Hispanic studies. As the founder of the Hispanic Society of America in New York City, Huntington was one of the most significant figures in the field. Other endowments followed his and the collection expanded until the Hispanic Division was formally established in 1939 under the leadership of Louis Hankey, the first director. The Hispanic Society Reading Room was inaugurated shortly after with the goal of providing researchers with access to the rapidly growing Luso Hispanic collections. Louis Hankey has been considered the father of the field of Latin American studies in the United States, as evidenced by his own work, his historiographical bent, and the many students he taught and mentored who went on to distinguished careers. And speaking of visionaries, he had the foresight to create the Handbook of Latin American Studies and, of course, brought it with him from Harvard to the Hispanic Division. His successors at LC, Howard Klein, Mary Ellis Kaler, William Carter, Sara Castro Clarin, Cole Blazier, and the current chief, Georgette Dorn, each added his or her touch and further expanded the stellar collections and excellent services, as well as extending the division's leadership into enduring professional associations such as the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, the Seminar and the Acquisition of Latin American Library Materials, SALAM, the Conference on Latin American History, and the Latin Americanist Research Resources Project. I often find myself in conversations at receptions, fundraising events, on airplanes, at gatherings of Duke alumni, and 100% of the time, I can count on being asked a version of this question. Do we still need libraries? The follow-up is usually a version of, when will everything be online? There's widespread confusion out there about the state of library collections and digital media. The evolution of the Handbook of Latin American Studies from its original medium, print, through CD-ROM, who remembers CD-ROMs, and finally into a fully digital online format is illustrative of the path of change for scholarly resources. Given the accelerated pace of technological shifts, what lies ahead for the Hispanic Division and its services to researchers and for Latin American studies collections in general? What plans should we be making? What should we anticipate? While I can't tackle the big question today of the future of libraries, this afternoon I'd like to share some of my impressions of the nature and direction of transformation in research libraries and their area studies collections. I will then cite a number of steps we can take to ensure that we, individuals, groups, research institutions, and libraries, build a framework that puts technology to work to enable the continued creation of new scholarship. I believe that the changes we are witnessing bode well, and that by continuing to take advantage of the opportunities offered by digital tools, the Hispanic Division will, well into the future, continue to be the highly valued institution that connects researchers with the scholarly resources they seek. First, let me say a few words about the past. For years, librarians have worried about what came to be known as the crisis in foreign acquisitions. And I bet some of you in the room are familiar with the crisis. A crisis usually is a kind of a short-term thing, but in this case, it's been with us for a while. It's a concern that we were not, as a community, able to keep up in our collection building with the scholarly output from Latin America and other world regions. That crisis has not been entirely resolved, but it has since been addressed in part by the Center for Research Libraries Global Resources Network and its component projects, including the Latin Americanist Research Resources Proje Project, in which the Hispanic Division, as I mentioned, has played a leading role. The impact of this crisis has been somewhat tempered by an array of collaborative digital projects that have put area studies at the forefront of promising new developments that expand access for scholars. This is especially important in the transition from print to digital, as we find opportunities to collaborate to create new models of digital dissemination. Rather than being in crisis, I would say we have entered a new era of digital opportunity. Hosted by Duke University, a December 2012 conference, The Global Dimensions of Scholarship and Research Libraries, brought together by invitation 50 scholars, librarians, administrators, and representatives of scholarly societies and funding agencies. The principal objective of the forum was, quote, to bring an international focus to the current conversations 
regarding the future of research libraries and to consider how our mission to collect, preserve, and provide access to a wide array of materials created and published around the world, and thus to support scholarship broadly, can be achieved in the present environment." Unquote. The forum engaged a variety of stakeholders in a multifaceted assessment of the current situation and the generation of creative potential projects, solutions, and next steps. The analysis and recommendations that emerged from that meeting include positive steps we can take now to ensure future access to scholarly resources, and I would like to share the findings of the forum with you as we look ahead to the next 75 years of the Hispanic Division. First, it is important to acknowledge that scholarly agendas are evolving. Traditional area studies scholarship remains vital and robust, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. But the perspectives of professional schools and policymakers in the global arena are increasingly prominent as well. And even in the arts and sciences, scholarly attention is turning toward broad trans transnational issues, such as financial flows, commodity chains, religion, energy and water resources, world music, social justice. These topics, along with others, such as crime and disease, environmental stress and climate change, and cross-border movements of people and ideas, require an interdisciplinary approach. Many are being addressed by cross-national teams. All require robust access to international information. The academy is global. The globalization of US universities has become a strategic mandate. Individual faculty members are engaged in broader and more frequent collaboration with colleagues around the world. The components of global knowledge are changing, and digital communications are allowing more wide-ranging exchanges than ever before. Partnerships with foreign universities, new overseas campuses are more and more common. The need for knowledge of many different cultures and histories is ever more urgent. Understanding the global is based on deep knowledge of the local. Libraries and their collections persist, even as priorities are shifting. Area specialists in US research libraries have, over decades, painstakingly built up our expansive collections country by country, region by region. These US holdings are often stronger than those in the countries of origin. That is certainly true of the rich collections of the Hispanic division. Nonetheless, the continuing strength of our international print holdings matches less and less well with emerging approaches to research and learning. Digital resources are increasingly central to the landscape of information production. Today's users expect readily accessible electronic resources as they conduct their work. Scholars work with new media. Libraries now emphasize digital resources and tools. We must sustain, celebrate, and fully utilize our international print collections while also building robust digital access and services for the future. Two broad recommendations that emerge from the Global Forum are especially relevant to the future of the Hispanic Division. The first is a challenge. Aggressively pursue broad digital access to international information resources. The behavior and expressed preferences of students and scholars reveal increasing eagerness for digital access to information. Users both anticipate that the resources they seek will be available in electronic formats, and they seem less likely to seek out information that is not readily accessible online. I want to make clear that I'm not dissing books, because I really, I, books are at the, the, the foundation of all of this. I'm just uh, speaking about trends I've been seeing. A corollary is that knowledge and scholarship in digital form creates and accelerates its own demand. Easy mechanisms for discovery and access lead to expanded usage and citations, reinforcing future use. While these attributes of digital resources today apply primarily to English language resources, which comprise the bulk of the electronic universe now at our users' disposal, enhanced digital access will similarly extend the reach and impact of non-English materials. I would guess that the Hispanic Division has seen this happen with the online collections offered on the website. Digital resources are by their nature accessible without regard to time, space, geography. Students and scholars throughout the world, including in the countries that produce materials now held only in US libraries, will benefit from access to resources that would otherwise remain out of reach 
and in fact may gain that access on mobile devices. Proposed areas for action in which the Hispanic Division and our universities and other institutes can certainly play a role. First, build a comprehensive shared collection of public domain digital resources from around the world, engaging scholars and information experts from all fields and regions. Inventory and link current digital projects, identifying and actively addressing gaps in coverage. Work with publishers, vendors, and other partners to provide new resources in digital formats, whether born digital or digitized from print, and including licensing terms and conditions that support resource sharing. Encourage scholars worldwide <coughs> excuse me, to deposit and or digitize their own research materials and results in open access repositories. Explore new acquisitions mechanisms, for example, something we call catch and release collection development, meaning you go to a country, digitize something, leave the materials in country, and then make the digital version available. To expand digital offerings, non-custodial archiving, another version of the same thing, and retention of scarce or unique patrimonial resources in their places of origin. <coughs> yeah, thanks. Create and promulgate model agreements for international digitization partnerships. Work with national libraries, publishers, scholarly groups, and other appropriate agencies to resolve issues of intellectual property related to access and preservation. The second major recommendation emerging from the global resources, uh, for the global forum, calls for us to broaden and internationalize library collaborations. Research libraries in the United States have a long history of cooperation that includes both formal consortia and ad hoc partnerships. Area studies resources, which can be difficult to acquire and at times have relatively low use, have been particularly good candidates for cooperative action. Some region-specific efforts are now expanding to include both international partners and the scholars, publishers, vendors, and others who are engaged in creating and disseminating international information. Museums, non-governmental organizations, government agencies, and other institutions concerned with knowledge and information are likewise relevant. We need to consciously construct a more comprehensive, multilateral, and distributed international base for collaborative action. Under this recommendation, the proposed areas for action are recruit consortial participants and leaders from outside the United States, engage more fully with libraries and kindred organizations beyond the United States and Canada, Develop a better understanding of the potential roles and contributions of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, national libraries, foreign universities, and other organizations as partners in international digital initiatives. Promote international analyses of and responses to intellectual property issues and global action to provide the most generous possible access to currently produced information. Explore collaborations that have arisen in other countries and regions as possible models for new regional or international initiatives. And develop an inventory of successful collaborations and identify areas in which new partnerships would be beneficial. In conclusion, research libraries take the long view. While scholarly projects and intellectual trends may shift, libraries take seriously their responsibility to document and preserve human knowledge over time, regardless of the format. Just as we've done with print and with our remarkable special collections in libraries across the country, including, of course, the unmatched Library of Congress, we are now challenged to acquire, preserve, and provide access to a much wider array of media. A scholar may wish to consult a colonial manuscript from the Viceroyalty of La Plata, the papers of a contemporary Latin American writer, presidential messages from Brazil, census data from Mexico, or human rights documentation from Chile, films and other documents concerning labor movements and unrest in Central America or farm workers in the United States, or maps that visually depict the connections between the African slave trade and the Caribbean. But newer and even more fragile sources are increasingly serving as the raw materials for new scholarship including websites that are created by political actors, parties, and movements, 
for example, and which may vanish soon after election day, or self-published e-books or tweets and videos made on cell phones, just think of Arab Spring, and other products of social networking. These are totally new kinds of what librarians have traditionally called ephemera. Or consider the hard drives of modern writers rather than their handwritten or typewritten manuscripts or literary drafts composed using WordPerfect or another defunct program and stored on floppy disks. These will all serve as important resources for future scholars and our research libraries must be capable of capturing them, migrating them as necessary to ensure their continued accessibility and preserving them, a mind-blowing challenge that can best be met through innovative collaboration. It is incumbent on us to develop a coherent strategy to advance international scholarship through a digitally intertwined network of libraries and researchers. I will close by paraphrasing a comment from Duke President Richard Broadhead. Um, it's a couple years old, but it's still very uh, true. After I made a presentation to Duke's Dean's Cabinet, I believe it conveys well the expanding role of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress and of research libraries everywhere. Quote, you have the very difficult job of continuing to honor the legacy of the past while reaching as far into the future as you can see to anticipate where scholarship, learning, and teaching are headed. I couldn't agree more with him. Thank you for your attention and for being part of this happy celebration. Thank you very much, Deborah Jacobs. That was very wonderful. I want to thank additional people here. There are members of the Embassy of Spain, Mexico, and Colombia here, who I would like to thank for coming. And also my daughter, Georgette Verdin, who came from Boston especially for this celebration. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Franklin Knight. He was born in Jamaica and attended the University of West Indies where he graduated with a bachelor's degree with honors. He gained a PhD at the University of Wisconsin. He taught five years at the State University of New York in Stony Brook and was a visiting lecturer various times at the University of Texas in Austin, Howard University, Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, Colgate University, as well as the universities of Huelva, Sevilla, and Pablo de Olavide in Spain. Knight joined the faculty of the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in 1973 and in 1978 became the first non-white professor to be granted academic tenure in history at the university. In 1991, he was appointed the Leonard and Helen R. Stuhlman Professor of History. He was director of the Program of Latin American Studies from 1995 to 1998, and the director of the Center for Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins, 2011 and 2014. King has held research fellowship from the Social Science Research Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, the Ford Foundation, and the National Humanities Center. He has served on committees of the Social Science Research Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Inter-American Foundation, the, National the American Historical Association, and the Conference of Latin American History. But his main uh, cause of being uh, associated with us that from 1973, to the, to the 90s, he was contributing editor of the Handbook of Latin American Studies and is on his board of um, advisors uh, until this very day. Uh, he has written so many books that if I read them, the, uh, the whole time would be gone. So it is a great pleasure to introduce Franklin Knight. I want to thank Georgette for that marvelous introduction, but I want to confess the real reason I'm here. That is because I'm so old, you could have guessed that from the introduction, that I was invited here 10 years ago at the 65th <laughs> anniversary of the founding of the Hispanic Division, and I got the invitation because they didn't think I would be around for the 75th <laughs> anniversary. So that was a little premature. But they thought of another reason in that uh, I think I'm one of the few in this audience who have known every single head of the Hispanic division of the Library of Congress, from Luis Hanke. I remember sharing sherry and other things in Sevilla in hot summers with him, all the way down to the present uh, head of the division, whom I recall 
when I was young and she was younger, and I was preparing my first book in one of the desks somewhere in the middle of this room. The room looked larger then for some strange reason. <laughs> As we get older, things seem to change on us. But it was a marvelous time to be around in the mid-70s before the world got totally crazy. And we could, as researchers here, and that was even before I had my little stint with a handbook, just walk up that stair and fetch any book you wanted at any time. And in fact, you could stay in the stacks until I think it was four o'clock when they drove you out. They kept someone walking around searching for people who had fallen asleep in stacks of books they had taken out, intending to read, but of course, were overtaken by the moment. I think that this was a construction of foresight, the Hispanic division and its product, the Handbook of Latin American Studies. I think when one looks back, in 1939, it would be hard to think that in the big thinking in Washington and the few then recognized centers of educational leadership that Latin America would play a major role. And in fact, it didn't. I think the founding of the Hispanic Division, just as the reorientation of American foreign policy, was really an accidental discovery. And uh, the story has not been really told very well, but it's Nelson Rockefeller's uh, idea, actually, having bought a substantial proportion of the country of Venezuela to discover that he couldn't get any English language radio there and that most of what he could pick up at the time was either German or French. So he came back and said, we have to do something about Latin America. Of course, as a property holder there, that was a natural response. And in 1939, well, actually, the, the organization started in 1927, but it's in 1935 that a real serious committee, if my memory serves me right, uh, under the sponsorship of the, uh, not the Rockefeller, um, Mellon, I think was Mellon Foundation, that said there should be an organization and an organized way. There was new thinking about Latin America. And uh, Louis Hanke was encouraged to do this. There were really two candidates uh, for this. Frank Tannenbaum was the other one. Tannenbaum had been all around Latin America by that time. He, was, uh, he had changed himself to become a Mexico specialist, was very friendly with several Mexican presidents, and was very, I think there were seven members of the 1935 committee drawn from all over the East Coast. This is the uh, political elite's conception of the United States. It shouldn't go further than the Mississippi River and it should run from Washington to Boston or something to that effect. But uh, we can look back at what they did as a really marvelous contribution to the posterity of this country. Because this was indeed a magnificent achievement, and it has worked very well. Uh, the handbook, without doubt, has become the principal catalyst for scholarly research in Latin America and the Caribbean, and I would say further afield. I have had the opportunity to engage with Latin Americanists in Asia and Australia and in Europe. And everywhere I go, uh, we can talk about the Handbook of Latin American Studies. And now that it's in three formats, even more readily so than before. And I am especially delighted to have been associated with the Handbook for so many years. I started as a contributing editor in 1974. At that time, the section on the Caribbean could be handled by one person, and I could quite easily do the reviews. By the time I gave it up in 1982, I was working full-time at it, being a full-time father, full-time husband, full-time professor, and full-time uh, contributing editor for the handbook. Uh, that I am still here and not at the Shepherd Pratt Institute in Baltimore, some of you might know the importance of that institution, uh, is a marvel. Uh, the handbook over the years has responded to the literary explosion, but it has also been a leader in terms of guiding the field. 
The role played by the handbook and its staff and its contributing editors in the development of Latin American studies is truly remarkable and deserves, in fact, a history of its own. I suggested that when I was president of the Latin American Studies Association, but those were very political times and it was hard to do that. But I think that for over 50 years, this handbook has really managed to keep a track on the best. Uh, it, it's not always uh, correct, and we are all human. Sometimes we review books at a moment in time when we fail to appreciate, as the author would have us, the importance of the subject. But then we should recall that to err is human and to forgive divine. And if we forgive, forgive a slightly unacceptable review, uh, that is the author here, of any book, then we approach a little closer to divinity. Uh, the library's daily editorial work on the handbook, carried out in close consultation with specialists in the research community, has been without doubt the single most important aspect in shaping the, the, the collection of the Hispanic division and making it, as we have heard on many occasions, one of the finest in the world. And on that, I think there can be no dispute. I know nowhere else where you can find so many different editions of the same author and so conveniently as located here. It is well known that contributors to the Handbook of Latin American uh, uh, Studies have played important roles, not only by their reviews in selecting the books, but bringing to the attention of the handbook editors uh, important publications which deserve uh, attention. And I think as we move, especially that it's being digitized in so many ways, we might, and this is one of the challenges of the future, might have to move beyond just published material and look into uh, recording and uh, evaluating within the handbook these other forms of transient productions uh, that are so important when we begin to recapture the history of communities. The function of the handbook, as I've said, has been crucial. It certainly was when I was in the distant ages, a century ago, a graduate student. It was my sort of Bible. I tried to tell students that, you know, I was born in the past century. I'm very, very old. And to people who don't have collective memory beyond a smartphone, they always say, well, how are you still alive? And I like to shock them by saying, I jumped ship when Columbus landed. Uh, it used to even fascinate my kids, but now they've got accustomed to the bad joke. Uh, I think, as I said, the, the, the function of the handbook is crucial today. And one area, it's, I, I don't just want to talk about the handbook, I really want to blend it in the Hispanic division because I think they are inseparable. And one of the things I have liked about the division, apart from the facilities it affords to scholars, is the fact that it has been so instrumental in revitalizing or in the creation of the leading Latin American groups that we have. The Conference in Latin American History, uh, the Latin American Studies Association, which I think is actually the, uh, the uh, 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 older one, and that might be the, the, the Conference of Latin American History, but that died and then was revived. So the first uh, birth doesn't really count. But in the 60s, all the new Latin American area organizations depended on the Library of Congress and were hosted by the Library of Congress a lot of the time at their birth. And we owe this, of course, to the important people who have headed the, the division over the years. We have been really very fortunate in that all of them have been genuine devotees of Latin American studies and have played individual significant roles in developing the fields themselves. I like this place, I've indicated that, but I will repeat it in case some of you were sleeping when I first mentioned it, because it has always been a user-friendly place. I remember as a very young unknown scholar marching in here and being given the facilities, I couldn't believe it. I had a library of about 14 million books that I could wander through. In those days, you could wander through the stacks if you were a bona fide researcher and come down 
And they even had a cafeteria that served decent food, a cut above the institutional. And you can tell by my size that I did not arrive at this girt by wishful thinking, but by real exercise at this. And so I liked it. It was heaven to me. I think I've done more research here, not in the last years, of course, because I became overcome by institutional duties as well as senility. But I spent more time here than in my own library. From its inception, therefore, the handbook has been a pioneer in eradicating those conventional boundaries. In this room, people could do research without identifying yourself by a discipline. And that was a very important dimension, and I still think an important dimension to area studies. I think that the disciplines are for convenience, what we seek are answers to questions which transcend these narrow, artificial, convenient structures that we call disciplines. And one of the early qualities of the handbook was, and remains to me, those annual reports that the archivists and librarians from outside the country used to submit about the state of their archives and the state of their books. And if you were going there, it was really good to get an idea, what is it in the National Library in Rio that you could want to look at, or what it is in Buenos Aires that was worth your time going to. That was a feature that I think was really very important as it got bigger, that section got uh, shrunk. And the other was the general essays, which I think are still a feature of the handbook and which are also accessible in digital format and, uh, and available much more readily than they used to be. So I would say that over the years, apart from my fondness for this, the Hispanic Division and the Handbook of Latin American Studies have established a healthy symbiotic relationship with the international scholarly community through the series of ongoing exhibitions, which we have come to, timely publications of guides and research aids, as well as general publications, some of which are advertised all over the place. This room represents a veritable mecca for specialists in the field of Latin American studies. And each year, as we go about our business, wherever we are, we realize more and more that this is the most important locale for the research we do. It's been slowly built up over 75 years, and it is my hope that it will continue for 750 years at least. Thank you. To, to add to this wonderful presentation by Franklin, I'd like to add that Howard Klein revived the Card for Latin American History. So from 1961 to 1972, the conference was headquartered in the Hispanic Division. And LASA, Latin American Studies Association, was actually founded right here in 1966. And the headquarters were here until about 1972, 73, when they went to Florida and then to Pittsburgh. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Enrique Pumar. He's the associate professor and chair of the sociology department at the Catholic University of America, a specialist in international migration, urban development in Latin American and Caribbean studies. Dr. Pumar is consulting editor of the Handbook of Latin American Studies, and he serves at the editorial board of, of the Sociological Forum, the Journal of Sociology and Theory of Religion, in the Delaware Review of Latin American Studies. In 2013, he was awarded the Outstanding Author Contribution Award by the Emerald Literati Net Network. Dr. Pumar was appointed visiting scholar in the Institute of the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University during 19, 2014 and 2015, and is a fellow and member of the executive board of the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies. His recent publications include Hispanic Migration and Urban Development, Emerald Press 2012, and Hispanics and the American Dream, a chapter which will be published next year in a book about Latinos and the American Dream. And we give him up. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Georgette, uh, Catalina, and the other organizers for inviting me to participate in this celebration, in this celebratory occasion, along with uh, such distinguished panelists. I, I really feel very humble. And most importantly, for your warm introduction. When I received the invitation to participate in the symposium, uh, the first thought that came to my mind was my former professor, Carlos Diaz Alejandro. When Diaz Alejandro uh, was invited to be part of the so-called Kissinger Commission, he used to say, the invitation was really meant for my brother, but it was sent to me by mistake. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Carlos Diaz Alejandro's brother is a painter in, in, in Paris. Luckily, I don't have any siblings. <laughs> And hence, I quickly realized that I received uh, this invitation to reflect on my experience and, as consumer and my work as consulting editor uh, for the, on sociology for the Handbook of Latin American Studies. Like many other scholars around the room and throughout the world, I assiduously visited the Hispanic reading room every time my research was required. I have always found the reading room welcoming, the decor inspiring, and everyone extremely helpful. I must confess I particularly enjoy the tertulias and cafecitos on Friday afternoon when I manage to attend. I am uh, also responsible for many of the hits uh, that the online co collection received every year. However, it was not until my appointment that I began to reflect in earnest about what the handbook means to researchers like us. We all know that since its first publish, the handbook continued to be one of the most comprehensive annotated references of Hispanic scholarship material in the world. I would argue, however, that this envious uh, distinction is, is one of its least notorious accomplishment. There are three other that come to mind. First, Publishing a bibliographical reference which highlight intellectual accomplishment for Latin America about the same time that arrogant modernization uh, and more recently ethnocentric theories dominate the social sciences is simply daring. And who in his right mind will have appointed a poet and from Chile to edit the Maverick publication in 1947? However, the handbook has always been a lawyer friend, uh, why should I say moreover, the handbook has always been a lawyer friend to sociology. Already in the first volume, four sociological entries were published, including one from a young scholar by the name of G Gilberto Freire. Second, for the most part, the handbook houses critical studies of Latin American reality. This is also courageous when you come to think that it is one of the few publications that has done so consistently for so long, and this trend continues today in the midst of an environment of full suspicions of intellectual endeavors, especially when they are outside the mainstream. To illustrate this point, I'd like to refer to the literature of urban marginality. While uh, many of my uh, colleagues, North American colleagues, carry insightful and contentious debates about social mechanisms of survival in the slums and about the regulatory norms of control among the dispossessed, studies published regularly in the handbook remind us, on the other hand, that we must consider social relations in the proper historical context. And that uh, the forward and backward linkages connecting the world economy and urban metropolis condition how inequality reproduces, and how the action, uh, actions of, uh, for mo for most, actions that for most may, may, uh, may seem like triumphal ingenuities, for example, the, the informal market, are in fact desperate attempts of survival. In other words, while uh, some approach the urban problematic uh, from a problem-solving epistemology, studies in the handbook always invite us to ponder questions and to reflect about social tribulations. Finally, 
if I had to pick the most lasting achievement of the 75 years, it has, it has to be what Albert O'Hishman fittingly called boys. Since its inception, the handbook has given boys an agency to countless of cadres of scholars in academia who otherwise would have often been invisible through no fault of their own. Which other publication in the social sciences houses so many Hispanic contributors as a handbook? Where else comparable numbers of studies from Latin American scholars are published in every edition? In a non-scientific review of top journals around the social sciences, I couldn't find uh, uh, any, uh, one that would match uh, the handbook record in this regard. The handbook is more than a repository of literary reviews. The handbook is the vibrant, eloquent, innovative, controversial, and entrepreneurial community that we are. In closing, uh, we have many reasons to celebrate this and many other anniversaries. Hoping that our uh, Hispanic division and Hamburg continue to strive, despite the challenges and uncertainty ahead, I offer the words of Ralph Ellison. And any problem was, I'm, I'm sorry, and my problem was that I always tried to go in everyone's way but my own. I have been called one thing and then another, while uh, no, no one really wished to hear what I call myself. So after years of trying to adopt uh, the opinions of others, I finally rebelled. I am the invisible man. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, is uh, Dr. Charlotte Rogers. She received her PhD from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Yale University in 2009. She was recently a Kluge Fellow at the Library of Congress. Her research focuses on representations of the tropics in Latin American literatures and culture, especially on Cuba and Amazonia. Her first book, Jungle Fever, Exploring Madness and Medicine in 20th Century Tropical Narratives, was published in 2012. In the first half of 2014, she did work here at the Library of Congress, where she researched her new book manuscript on El Dorado in contemporary literature. She's assistant professor of Spanish at George Mason University, where she teaches Latin American literature and culture, comparative literature, modern studies, and post-colonial literature. Charla. Thank you very much, Dr. Dorn, for inviting me to speak here, and thank, thank all of you for coming. Um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the archive of Hispanic literature on tape. Uh, Dr. Dorn is actually the curator of this archive, and I had the opportunity to become familiar with it during my time, as she mentioned, as a John W. Kluge Fellow here at the library in the first half of 2014. Today, I'm going to speak a little bit about the history and the future of the archive, which contains 680 recordings in many languages, not just what Antonio de Nebrija would have called the lenguas compañeras del imperio, or the imperial languages of Spanish, French, English, and Portuguese. In fact, the archive also contains recordings in Haitian Creole, Catalan, Quechua, Nahuatl, and Zapotec. My real aspiration here today, however, is to open up the archive's auditory world of poetry and prose for all of you. I'll be playing four excerpts of the archive's recordings that highlight the extraordinary range, historical significance, scholarly value, and just sheer poetic force of the collection. So, Let's begin with the origins of the archive of Hispanic literature on tape. The Library of Congress began recording major literary figures of the Hispanic world in 1943, back when the Hispanic division was known as the Hispanic Foundation. One of the most unique early recordings is by the Chilean Nobel laureate, Gabriela Mistral. 
Mistral was famous for her policy of not reading her poetry in public. Yet, in 1953, she made one of only a few existing recordings of her poetry right here at the library. So, while the archive contains many recordings of Nobel Prize winners, including Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, and Pablo Neruda, Juan Ramon Jimenez, I could go on, but Mistral's recording holds special historical value. We're going to listen now to her brief poem entitled Meciendo. Um, in Meciendo, the poetic voice describes the action of rocking a child to sleep while also contemplating the rocking of the seas and the way that God rocks the universe. The wonderful thing about this recording is how you can hear the rocking motion of the poem's content repeated in the rocking of Mistral's intonation. So if you don't speak Spanish or in a bit Portuguese, you can listen to the rhythm and flow of these beautiful languages. So let's play the first track. Me siento. El mar sus millares de olas me se divino. Oyendo a los mares amantes me so a mi niño. El viento errabundo en la noche me se los trigos. Oyendo a los vientos amantes me so a mi niño. Dios Padre, sus miles de mundos meses sin ruido, sintiendo su mano en la sombra, meso a mi niño. So, the obvious importance of this short, just 30 second recording, and some others like it, led to a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation in 1958. This grant allowed the first curator of the archive, Francisco Aguilera, to travel in Latin America to record authors who were not able to come here to Washington. In later years, embassies and consulates around the world also recorded Hispanic authors. In fact, one of my favorite Cuban authors was recorded outside of the library. Um, and I was thrilled to learn that the other panelists here today all have a certain connection with Cuba. So, um, Severo Sardui lived in Paris from 1960 until his death from AIDS in 1993. Severo Sardui was one of Cuba's most verbally and thematically daring writers, and even of the entire 20th century, uh, not just in Cuba. So although Sardui was systematically ignored by the Cuban regime, both for his sexuality and for his disillusionment with the persecution of dissident authors, he was well known in Paris for his avant-garde linguistic gymnastics. This recording that you'll hear was made in 1983 when his novel Colibri, or Hummingbird, was about to be published. We're going to hear the very first lines of the novel, which immerse us in the tale of a young man who moves from the tropical forest to the city in order to work naked in a local bar. I'd like you to listen to how Sardui revels in the joy of each syllable of this incredibly complicated opening scene. I also want to warn you that this first paragraph generally sends both students and native speakers of Spanish scurrying for their dictionaries. So here it comes. Bailaba entre dos espejos, desnudo, detrás del bar. Las ballenas o cambos libidinosos y solventes que, ya entrada la noche, embebidos o cachondos, carenaban en el local, le deslizaban dólares verdinegros en las manos húmedas, o antes de que se la quitara de un tirón, bajo la cinta de cuero que le servía de slip. Había llegado en un mediodía ardiente, durmiendo en la proa de una barcaza de carbón gris y aplanada, sin tragaluces ni bandera, desde los pueblos cenagosos del estuario, para adornarse la piel con tintas de colores y participar en los pugilatos. Traía en los bolsillos un grano de jade y varias monedas, remotas o cuarteadas. Todo el día bebió maracuja con ron y cantó en un dialecto 
forestal y ronco, pródigo en vocales. No empujó la talanquera girante de la entrada, sino que, apoyándose en la mano derecha, se alzó en el aire, quedó un instante cenital ingrávido y cayó como quien baja de un tren en marcha del otro lado. A pesar de su altura y resiedumbre, lo bautizaron Colibrí. Era, por supuesto, rubio, pero... Cuando digo rubio, tienes que visualizar un pelo inmenso y engrifado, resplandeciente, albino más que rubio, abriéndose en cámara lenta y en volutas encadenadas. Oxígeno, ozono de lluvia, fibra de vidrio, pajusa de maíz soltando gotas finísimas, como el de un atleta victorioso emergiendo de un chapuzón. Okay, so I gave you a long fragment there to listen to how Sardui very masterfully juxtaposes his erudite language with a more colloquial interjection by the narrator describing the young man's blonde hair. Now you heard that era, por supuesto, rubio. Pero cuando digo rubio, tienes que visualizar, right? So in this way, uh, Sardui switches from a third person to a first person narrator. And by addressing the reader, or in our case, the listener, directly, he draws us in to Colibri, the novel. But he also winks at that meta-literary nature of his own writing. So I plan to use this recording the next time I teach Sardui to show the effects on the reader of changing the narrative point of view. Good. So, Next, we will listen to the Portuguese language recording that initially drew me to this archive. Last year, I arranged to travel to Rio de Janeiro to interview Milton Hatoum, one of Brazil's best living writers, for my new book project. Since I was a Kluge fellow here at the library at the time, uh, the library helped me in many ways. Uh, the Rio Acquisitions Office gave me a space to work in, which was in the embassy, by the way, guarded by Marines. So I think scholars and Marines don't usually get together, uh, but it was great. <laughs> um, in fact, the Hispanic Division's Dr. Yeda Wiarda uh, introduced me to the staff of the National Library of Brazil. But it turned out that the most important resource of the library was right here in the archive of Hispanic literature on tape. Dr. Wiarda herself had recorded an interview with Milton Hatoum in 1995. Now, I listened to that recording many, many times, uh, probably mostly to improve my fledgling Portuguese. But by the time I got to Rio, I felt like I knew Hatoum, uh, certainly as an artist, but even in this strangely intimate auditory way. So in this fragment you're going to hear, he talks with Dr. Wiarda about the reception of his first novel, A Tale of a Certain Orient, which dramatizes parts of his childhood in the Lebanese immigrant community in the Amazonian city of Manaus. Hatoum talks about how every novelist is concerned with verisimilitude, or the credibility of his narrative for the reader. Hatoum mentions the critic Jonathan Culler, which you'll hear, who wrote about the, how the author must enable the reader to suspend his disbelief and enter into the fictional world. Hatoum describes this process to Dr. Wiarda when he gave the novel to an elderly woman in Manaus who he called, quote, the living archive of his Lebanese family. And to his joy, she believed his story. So he concludes that this shows that any literary work, including his own, has resonance and relevance beyond the particular circumstances of his place and time. So here is Milton Hatoum. Uh, ela acreditou na história, porque eu acho que todo autor tem essa preocupação com a verossimilhança, né? Quer dizer, ninguém pode contar nada totalmente inverossímil, porque a imaginação do leitor não vai não, não vai acompanhar. acompanhar? Exatamente, não pode acompanhar. 
E não Exatamente. teria essas traduções, não teria Exatamente. sido tão bem recebido pelo mundo é. todo? Então, essa essa preocupação do autor, porque o leitor sabe que que ele vai ler alguma coisa que ele quer acreditar momentaneamente, pelo uhum. menos é o que o Coleridge disse, dizia, a suspensão da descrença. Sei. Quando alguém lê o um livro, uhum. ele ele finge ou assina um contrato de que ele vai acreditar que naquilo está que está lendo. né? E ela acreditou, né? Ela acreditou e ficou assustada, né? Aí eu pensei, vou dizer, bom, se o arquivo vivo da família, né? Se a pessoa que conhece mais histórias, que conhece todas as façanhas dos primeiros imigrantes e o fracasso dos filhos e netos que, como eu, não conseguiram prosperar, <risos> se ela conhece todas as histórias, né? E é porque ela, o romance passou, ultrapassou as fronteiras familiar, né? E talvez as fronteiras estreitas, os limites estreitos da província do Amazonas e da periferia. And uh, Dr. Wiarda is here this afternoon, and I can vouch for the fact that neither her voice nor Milton Hatoum's has changed at all in the 20 years that have elapsed since that recording was made. Good. So herein lies the scholarly value of the archive. I went to my interview with Hatoum with a firm idea of his concept of the role of the author, and I was able to interrogate him about that and how we see it play out in his later works. Um, I think that the author's other, the archive's other recordings of authors reflecting upon their work um, are invaluable, and I think that they're an underappreciated and underexplored uh, resource here at the Library of Congress. So, the final recording I'm going to play here today is by a writer who passed away recently. The Colombian poet and novelist Álvaro Mutis was a close friend of his compatriot, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who is also recorded in the archive. The two lived near each other in Mexico City, and they even died not long apart. Mutis, like Gabo, was extremely sensitive to the ability of literature to open up new dimensions in the soul. And we will hear his poem, Una Palabra, which talks about the power of the poetic word. Mutis evokes the emergence of poetry from those dank, haunted corners of the earth and of his own mind. This poem has it all, art, death, misery, a hint of sex, but you have to listen very closely because this recording made in the 1970s is not of high quality. So here it comes, Una Palabra. De mi libro, Los Elementos del Desastre, el poema Una Palabra. Cuando de repente, en mitad de la vida, llega una palabra jamás antes pronunciada, una densa marea nos recoge en sus brazos y comienza el largo viaje entre la magia recién iniciada, que se levanta como un grito en un inmenso hangar abandonado donde el musgo cobija las paredes. Entre el óxido de olvidadas criaturas que habitan un mundo en ruinas, una palabra basta. Una palabra y se inicia la danza pausada que nos lleva por entre un espeso polvo de ciudades hasta los vitrales de una oscura casa de salud, a patios donde florece el hollín y anidan densas sombras, húmedas sombras que dan vida a cansadas mujeres. Ninguna verdad reside en estos rincones y sin embargo, Allí sorprende el mudo pavor que llena la vida con su aliento de vinagre, rancio vinagre, que corre por la mojada despensa de una humilde casa de placer. I notice in the audience that when the recordings are played, many of you close your eyes, and I'm guessing you're not napping. Um, there is an interesting and very intimate uh, experience that happens when we listen to poetry or prose rather than just reading it on the page. So what you've heard in this fragment is Mutis's internal world of poetic creation, what he called poetry's dance of fertile misery. These few tracks I've played here really transport us from a land of fertile misery in Mutis to a contemplation of the divine forces rocking the world as Gabriela Mistral rocks us with her poetry. 
We've run the gamut from the joy of complicated polysyllabic wordplay in Sardui to the revelation of the inner workings of an author's mind with Milton Hatoum. Now, until very recently, traversing these peaks and valleys of human existence by listening to poetry recordings was only possible within the walls of this institution. As the name of the Archive of Hispanic Literature on Tape indicates, all of these recordings had been stored for patron use on cassette tapes, either here in the division or over in the Madison Building's uh, Center for Sound Recordings. The unintended result of that situation was that for a scholar of my age, listening to these recordings transports me back to my awkward middle school years. It was, was the last time that I used to make mixtapes with a cassette player. So I'm happy to say that the Library of Congress has embarked on a major project of expanding the accessibility and updating the format of the archive. So far, the Hispanic Division has digitized about 250 of these recordings, and the Center for Poetry and Literature has digitized 950 of its own. The assistant curator of the archive, Catalina Gomez, is working with the Center for Poetry and Literature to launch a new central resource that will be called the Literary Audio Archives of the Library of Congress. So eventually, this new archive will hold all the literary recordings of the library, irrespective of language. I think, as Franklin Knight said, the disciplines are really just a convenience for us. Even more important, this resource will be available in digital form, accessible by internet. So Catalina Gomez is coordinating the imminent web launch of the new literary audio archives, which will increase incrementally as the Hispanic and Poetry and Literature divisions each add a few digital recordings every month. I can't stress enough how important this project is, especially for teachers who want to make the poetry come alive in their classroom. So I'd like to say congratulations to the Hispanic Division on 75 years of recording excellence. Um, and Franklin also, Knight also spoke about uh, how honored he was to attend the 65th anniversary. I hope that by the time we get to the 85th and even the 100th anniversary, uh, we'll have even more digital recordings and materials made available for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Gabriel Mistral was the first Latin American, the first Latin American to re receive the Nobel Prize in Literature, and we have many other Nobel Prize winners recorded: Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, Octavio Paz, and Asturias, among others. Well, thank you very much for attending, and please stay for the reception. Come on. Oh, I'm sorry. Sí, me puse nerviosa, David Sartorius. I'm so sorry. Our next speaker is David. I get very emotional with the archive because I inherited it in 1972. It began in 1943, so many of the people you talked about I recorded, and I can no longer have time to do it because I'm so busy with the creeping bureaucracy. Um, David Sartorius is professor of history at the University of Maryland and specializes in colonial Latin America with a focus on race and the African diaspora in the Caribbean. His book, Ever Faithful, Race, Loyalty, and the Ends of Empire in Spanish Cuba, was published by Duke University, University Press in 2013, and he presented it here in April of this year. We do often do book presentations, so those of you who have written recent books, we will be happy to have you present your book here. Um, he, he is the author of essays about free colored mil militias, race and the historical memory, slave provision grounds, the 1812 Spanish Constitution, and the place of Darwinism in anthropology in 19th century Cuba. He has served as chair of the International Scholarly Relations Committee of the Conference of Latin American History and is currently a member of the editorial collective Social Text and the co-director of the Teposlan Institute for Transnational History of the Americas. Feel free to edit as you see fit. Thank you. <laughs> I read it just to make, make you all mad. David. Um, 
nobody told me I was going to have to follow Gabriela Mistral or Severo Sardui, I might have asked to have the, the order rearranged. They're a tough act to follow, and I'm, <laughs> it makes my own comments seem quite modest today. But I speak um, today like Professor Knight is someone who spent more time in this library than my own library at the University of Maryland. And like Professor Knight, someone who came here as a very young scholar at the beginning of his career, but unlike Professor Knight, never had something so glorious as stack access, which is the, I'm dizzy with envy. Um, and I'm, I also talk to you as someone who studies Cuba, like my other panelists do in some form or fashion. And that's, for me, this is, this makes me someone who's felt the, the kind of the geopolitical constraints <laughs> on the circulation of knowledge acutely throughout my career. Um, so really what I just want to offer a few autobiographical sort of remarks to, to explain how I'm standing in front of you today. I first came to the Hispanic division between, during the summer between college and starting graduate school in, in Chapel Hill. And um, I was an intern in the Senate. And on slow afternoons, I would come to the main reading room and read books. Uh, because someone said before I went to graduate school, the first thing that I'd learn in graduate school is how far behind I already was. <laughs> and he suggested starting to, to tackle the, the long historiographic tradition of, uh, in Latin America. So I had bought books by Lewis Hankey and Clarence Herring, and I took them with me to work every day. And when things got slow, I would come over here, little knowing that Lewis Hankey, whose face is floating over here in some moments, uh, was the first director of this, of this division. And so I would read and take scrupulous and rudderless notes on those books, um, hoping that I would become a Latin American historian of, of the first order. And one day I wondered if there might be manuscript sources at the Library of Congress about the study of Cuban history. In that direction, I requested a book in the main reading room by that was compiled by the, my future dissertation advisor, Lou Perez, called A Guide to Cuban Collections in the United States. And I was just looking at my Lewis Hankey book last night, and I found the, um, the call slip that was marked, not on shelf, that I made. And, and that's when someone down in the main reading room suggested that I come up here. And um, the Library of Congress, I just, if it, has, it hasn't been said yet today, it's an intimidating place. It's huge, and it's easy to get lost. And when you're 22, it's just overwhelming. So I came up here with quite a bit of trepidation, not really fully knowing what I was going to ask. But um, Barbara Tenenbaum was there waiting for me, and I said that I'm studying with Lou Perez. And the first thing she said was, a friend of Luis Perez is a friend of the Hispanic division. So what can I do for you? And indeed, she had the Guide to Cuban Collections in the United States in these shelves. And I looked, and there were 81 different manuscript collections for the study of Cuban history at the Library of Congress. That's more. This is a, this is a bibliography that covers the entire United States. And this is, there's more at this repository than any other, any other archive in the country. Um, so I took a quick peek. And I went downstairs to the, to the manuscript division and saw the papers of Domingo del Monte, who was a 19th century Cuban historian who had been tasked with assembling the history of Cuba and from what we can gather, plucked documents from Spanish and Cuban archives for his own personal collection, which is now downstairs. Uh, that was a nice reminder to treat archives and, and libraries with care and respect. <laughs> and, and so off I went to graduate school. And three years later, there was a real uh, kind of one of the formative opportunities of my, of my graduate education came in 1998 when there were all kinds of commemorations of the, of the 100th anniversary of, of 1898, which is the US's intervention in Cuba's final war for independence. And it was a, it was a year of lots of thinking about what the US's role in, in Cuba and Latin America and the world was. And the, the, the opportunity I got to take part in was a, a working group comprised, uh, it was organized by the, the American Council of Learned Societies and the Social Science Research Council. And it paired four North American historians of Cuba with four Cuban historians uh, from the island to come to Washington, DC to, for two weeks to work in archives. So we, we did spend days out in, co in College Park at the National Archives. But mostly, the eight of us spent our time here. And to, to um, to see the Cuban historians have the opportunity to work in archives from which they had been prohibited their entire lives um, 
was a gift. And it was a gift to work alongside them, to see that certainly we can go to Grover Cleveland's papers or William McKinley's papers or William Howard Taft's papers, these presidential papers that are well known. But what the Hispanic division has are papers of all kinds of other officials who were involved in 1898, sort of anyone from Rough Riders to the first uh, governor general of the island under US occupation. This was a kind of a window into empire that, that my Cuban colleagues had never seen before, and then by extension, I, I had neither. What I also remember about that visit was that the Hispanic division organized a round table where we could all speak, and there was also, a, there was also an excitement on the part of the Cuban participants to be able to speak as Cuban historians in and to the United States in this important centenary. Um, then I left the Library of Congress alone for a really long time. I was interested in the social history of slavery in Cuba and, and how race gets formed from the ground up. And there's a, there's a certain turn toward the archive and the manuscript collection and the local archive and the regional archive in Cuba that comes along with that and a certain uh, resistance to published materials. So I had a, the, the kind of rebellion against the sorts of resources that the Library of Congress might offer, right? They were products of the machine or the man that, I, that my goal as a historian was to push past. And it wasn't until I came back to, um, to Washington, D.C. when I started teaching at the University of Maryland that I had the opportunity to revisit the collections in the Hispanic division. And what it ended up doing was uh, completely transforming the project I was undertaking and taking way too long to finish that book. It's the wonderful thing about the Hispanic division is that you can now push a button on your computer and any book you're really interested in, unless you get a not on shelf um, message, will come to you. And it's also the curse of completing research projects that you can push your button and just about any book will come to you. It, it, uh, it slowed me down quite a bit, but it actually, but it transformed the project at the same time. Because what I came to find, of course, this shouldn't have been a surprise to me. But it, the, the kinds of historical subjects I was interested in weren't simply turning away from the sorts of institutions and official voices that, that are so prevalent here at the library. They're actually woven into it. And, it, and that unweaving process took me a long time, but I, I wouldn't have been able to do it anywhere else. Um, libraries and archives in Cuba are, to say they're, they've fallen under tough times is to make it sound a little more temporary than it is, right? This is where the climate control for archival holdings is, is minimal. So you have things that are molding and rotting. You have so many things in bad shape, the buildings themselves and the archival collections that really, and the Cuban scholars who were with me in 1998 made this clear. There were things you could see here about Cuban history that you couldn't see in Cuba and couldn't see in Spain, right? And uh, that speaks to geopolitical realities as much as it does uh, just sort of a, the, a random distribution of archival material. This has also been a place that's let me teach in, in really unique ways. And um, I wouldn't dare teach a research seminar on Cuban history if I didn't have the Library of Congress nearby. And even when I do, Students are happy to take advantage of the difficulty of finding primary sources for the study of Cuban revolution to come up with topics such as the two faces of Fidel Castro. These, they, these are not research topics. They kind of draw on the worst assumptions about the Cuban revolution and about the United States' uh, relationship with Cuba. And it's by, by directing students to the Library of Congress that I've had great success and that they've had great success. And I sent one here last week and he emailed me. I just wanted to read the email. I'd like to let you know that I had a very productive trip to the Library of Congress. I was able to register for a reader's card. It didn't cost and register myself at the Hispanic reading room. I met Mr. Perez and asked if he knew you. He had only great things to say about you, which enhanced the experience because he treated me well. And he gave me excellent pointers on how to use the catalog. Overall, excellent trip, and I can't wait to go back next week. This is a student who really was concerned that he was going to have to pay for a library card coming to the Library of Congress. Um, and I have to say, the, our government is in such a state that I hope it doesn't come to that. Um, and just to wrap up, I, there are just sort of two points I want to make with all of this. And the first is that the, my point isn't just that there are things in the Hispanic division that, that aren't available elsewhere. It's, the point really is that there are, 
it's not a coincidence that they're here and that the, the kinds of collections, especially for the history of Cuba in moments like 1898 and after 1959, right, they emerged out of historical processes, right, that themselves can be studied best through the resources here. And the second point is that I really can't think of any of these sort of intellectual explorations at the, at the library without thinking of the intellectual community that's built around it. So right when, when academics start talking about intellectual community, it's usually sort of um, to bemoan the lack of it or, the, or how hard it is to find. And I, I, I must say from the first time I entered this library, I, um, I found intellectual community. And, and those demands for community, it's just worth pointing out, aren't exhausted by the digital turn. So right, the idea that, that um, scholars across the Americas can be connected uh, and that, that access to materials is, is made uh, seamless through, through digital access is to, you know, is to overlook just basic global inequalities that include uh, differential access to the internet, right? So Cuba is still on dial-up for the most part. And the idea of my Cuban colleagues simply accessing sort of the many scanned things that, from the library uh, that, they, that, that other people could find just doesn't, it just doesn't bear out. So this is, think of this as just an extended thank you note. This is a, the Hispanic division's been a place that's, it's welcomed scholars from the US and from Latin America and beyond in ways that make tangible, sort of intellectual community that most people speak about only aspirationally. So in other words, you've, the Hispanic division has made the dreams of so many of us come true. So thank you very much. Well, this uh, concludes our program, but I want to present a special thank you to Franklin Knight for 41 years of faithful service, and I hope it continues to 50, 100. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.